You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the BNH app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan White. Greetings and welcome to the BNH Photography Podcast. Ten years ago this week, on January 15th, 2009, at about 3.24 p.m., U.S. Airways Flight 1549 took off from New York's LaGuardia Airport with 150 passengers and a crew of five for what should have been an uneventful flight to Charlotte, North Carolina. The sky was crystal clear and cold temperatures aside, it was a beautiful day to take to the air. The Airbus 320 had been climbing for three minutes when a flock of Canadian geese crossed paths with the plane taking out both engines. Captain Chesley Sullenberger, a seasoned pilot, quickly assessed the situation and despite requests from the ground to attempt a dead stick landing at one of two nearby airports, chose to follow his instincts to make sure everybody on board would be hugging their loved ones before the day was up. And as we all know, he did just that. Our guests today are photographer Stephen Mallon, who spent two weeks photographing the recovery efforts for Flight 1549, which for the record is on permanent display at its intended destination, the Charlotte Douglas International Airport. We're also gonna be joined by Denise Lockie, who is seated in seat 2C on Flight 1549. Denise will be with us in the second part of today's show, and we look forward to hearing from her. For now, Stephen Mallon specializes in challenging oversized projects. In addition to aircraft extractions, Stephen has documented the transportation and installation of the New Willis Avenue Bridge here in New York City, large-scale recycling operations, the dumping of subway cars into the ocean to create reefs, and documenting the construction of a floating liquid natural gas plant in Korea that is being billed as the largest floating structure in the world. His clients include the New York City Department of Transportation, the Grand Central Terminal, and his work has appeared in National Geographic, the New York Times, and Forbes. Currently, Stephen has an exhibit of large prints from a few of his series, including Flight 1549 Recovery at the Front Room Gallery on Hester Street in Manhattan. Greetings. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real treat. Your stuff is, like, amazing. Thank you. Um, before we talk about the flight, you, you deal with photographing really large scale projects, oversized things. How'd you get into that? I'm a kid in a sandbox. Oh, okay. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> These are giant toys. They really, really are. I mean, it's, it's, I get that. They kind of look like it whenever you see them photographed. <laughs> no. no, so, so how, how did you actually fall into this? Was it intention or did you just, was it just happenstance that you just started getting stuff like this? It was a mixture of all of it. I have been working in the photo industry um, since the mid 90s. I got to, I went to school at Rochester at RIT, 92 another, to 96. Yeah, another one. Um, you get a lot of them here. A lot of them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, 96 through 2000. I was working production in the city, assisting for everybody and anything that uh, came to my table just because I was also figuring out what I liked and didn't like about the photo industry. Um, So I took every single job along the way from corporate to children to animals to travel to National Geographic uh, to Vanity Fair. We were in the White House uh, with Timmy Greenfield Sanders, um, just a whole gamut of assignments. And during that whole process, um, I'm already starting to exhibit with friends. Uh, a friend of mine did a pop-up show in his like basement studio space in Tribeca, and it was their first show. And I went and printed like thirty by fifty inch uh, prints out of a fashion test that I'd done, mm. and just pinned them up to a wall. Mm. And that 30 was thirty by fifty. Thirty by fifty. <laughs> but so that's you, a good way starting. Yes. Were, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Work prints. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but so you were already kind of thinking about blending the idea of working photographer reportage with fine art, at least to the sense that you're going to blow them up and put them on walls, right? Yeah, I've always wanted to have the images up on the wall. I feel like that that is the uh, long-term goal, but I also was very aware of how much of a challenge it is to survive on that. So I never wanted to go into fine art as a fine art photographer. It's like I was very determined to make sure I knew what the hell I was doing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so the work is developing. I am uh, photographing. I'm starting to travel. I get picked up by um, Getty and then uh, Photonica to start producing images for licensing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm starting to travel a little bit more. We're on the road. I'm going to Europe. Are you Um, shooting on spec or is this for assignment? Well, it's it's kind of on spec. They're not... 
So they are, I'm going out photographing what I want, and then they are making selects based on it. They are also giving me assignment uh, stock shoots that they were uh, producing. So they would give me a budget for production. Like we rented an entire factory at one point and brought in talent for two days and set up shoots uh, within the environment. And so, uh-huh. okay, all right. Mm-hmm. So you had a guaranteed paycheck one way or the other. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Exactly. Because I just said, the- rather than going out on spec and saying, "Yeah, I think I'll take good pictures," and they're going to buy them from you. No. So you 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 were, you were guaranteed. Okay. It, no, 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 it was, but it was both. Because sometimes it was like I want to do because I would get the royalty rate is better when I was paying for it myself. Gotcha. So okay. that's the sometimes deciding point. So mm-hmm. if they had something specific that they knew that they wanted to do and it was kind of like, well, I can either pay for this myself and make more money in the long term or get that paycheck now and then use that money to, you know, was this pay renting. You, I mean, how did you figure all this out? Was this something you just learned all along the way, how you can kind of make a deal a little better for yourself? And also you know, choosing this kind of stuff you wanted to photograph, was it, because I think a lot of people have that problem. They're like, you know, I'd love to photograph this and this, but at the same time... Meantime, you got to photograph shoes to pay your bills. uh, And the world, in the world in general is telling you, you know, focus on something, find a style, do this, you know. Absolutely. And And it was definitely evolving. Like when I got out of college, I was planning on being a fashion photographer. Mm. I was shooting like photo illustration work and shooting, you know, but... I actually realized that it wasn't doing anything to do with fashion. I was just trying to make beautiful photography. Mm. And so when Mm. I started showing it to like actual, you know, fashion magazines in New York, they were kind of like, where's the clothing? (laughs) (laughs) But they're awesome pictures. Can't we just... Nice composition. (laughs) Exactly. The light. And they're like, oh, but we don't like... That's a a good one because I've seen so many fashion things have nothing to do with fashion or, or any ads. Quite often the photograph has zero to do with the product. It, yeah, it's an attitude. It's and which was that was what I was inspired by and inspiring to be. And I think that the percentage, the number of people that are getting paid to do that work in the fashion industry is pretty small. Pretty small. Yeah, okay. And that, along with um, the environment in the fashion industry, I realized was uh, not a fit for me. Mm. Um, so I got out of fashion. And so, was there one project that? It kind of set you in this direction? Is there one particular assignment that said, well, you know what, um, I'll find more work this way? So part of the things that uh, evolved is one of the trips that I took was to uh, Niger in mm. Northern Africa. And I shot this entire body of work and was and really- And this is on spec, this is for you, or this is assignment? This is on spec okay. uh, slash personal right. work. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I'm out there, I've got my Hasselblad, um, a Sunpack ring flash, which I thought was going to be TTL because Hasselblad has a hot shoe, so therefore it will communicate. <laughs> um, so I found out when I got there, not exactly. But um, <laughs> if you leave it in the sun, it gets warm. It's not really a hot shoe. <laughs> okay, sorry. So anyway, I had um, brought this body of uh, work back to my editor at Photonica, and she liked it, but she pointed out that like the market... Uh, where it's really going to be helpful is stuff that has more of the human element in it, where it's more industrial, like the uh, landscapes that, that are, you know, have got the footprint of mankind and humankind. And so I said, so like more on like, you know, parking lots and the power stations and everything. She was like, exactly. And I was like, well, that's actually some of the work that I had been doing before I went to college because I was running out to airstrips and construction sites and like literally running across where the machines were to get better camera angles and periodically just getting kicked out so I wouldn't uh, get destroyed by a bulldozer. Aircraft control did get a radio call that there was somebody laying down on the um, runway um, (laughs) when they were coming and... (laughs) You're a man after my own heart. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so found out. Why don't people like, understand these things? What you're trying to do? They don't get a it. Better angle. They, I get it's true, <laughs> right? And what? But what was the draw <laughs> at that time? Was it something you're always interested in? It, it was. It was the. Uh, I had always been attracted to mass transit. Like my family is from uh, Europe, England, and Ireland, and. Uh, so I, the cities that we grew up in in the U.S. did not have any actual like mass transit, but I was always in love with the metro system in London. You know, the tube was just like amazing. I couldn't figure out how the entire system worked and everything. And so like some of this and getting back to the Legos was just like playing with trains and literally the original Thomas the Train, which was like a hand drawn ink book, was like one of the books that I grew up with. And uh, I just never lost the attraction of mass transit and infrastructure throughout my development. And so when uh, Karen De Silva, who was the creative director of Photonica, um, said to me, you know, we need, the landscape work is good, but what's going to make it really marketable are these photographs more that have got the human um, footprint, the industrial footprint in them. Uh, it made sense to me that, 
oh, this is a way I can actually start combining what I'm still attracted to and capture that is then potentially going to ge um, generate a revenue stream. So we start shooting. Um, the body of work is getting together. I put together a landscape book of this work, and I'm showing it around uh, to different people, different you know agencies and magazines, and stock licensing is still uh, coming in at this time. But um, along the way, I get approached by a book agent who was interested in publishing a book with me. And at the time, I felt that I didn't have enough of a body of work of Stephen Mallon's cool photography book to really make a solid you know, coffee table book. So I then um, started talking uh, with my wife, and we were like driving around in some of these locations shooting, and we started thinking about what have I been doing all this time along the way that also can cost, you know, possibly feed into this. And we realized that uh, one thing that's kind of a hot topic at that point, this is 2007, um, was the recycling industry because the uh, general industry was under fire um, because of all the animosity towards the White House at the time. And I wanted to find something that was positive. So anyway, so yeah, so we came up with the idea to focus on the recycling industry and uh, put kind of the umbrella that it was going to stay within the 50 states. And I hired a writer and uh, we put together a, a draft of a proposal. And so I started contacting companies. And that got me access into a scrapyard in New Jersey. It got me to a couple of electronic plants, one in California, one in Minnesota. Um, I went out and photographed a cement reclamation uh, facility in California. And uh, this all started building this uh, body of work. And so along this way, I am still meeting with uh, creatives trying to get hired uh, to get actual commissions on jobs. And I had, had a couple of meetings with the uh, art buyer who was on ExxonMobil at the time. And she was pointing out to me that the landscapes are beautiful, but like until we start seeing photographs of the workers or the actual guys doing the work or like a guy with a wrench in his hand, I'm not going to be able to bring this back to the client. And I had been photographing lifestyle along this uh, process as well for stock and everything. So I had this lifestyle book and I had this industrial landscape, but I was always trying to keep it kind of separate because this was the long term and this was the short term kind of. And I realized that, um, you know, the client is telling me what they need and it's right. like, I either listen to them or not. And, and was that, was that hard in the sense that you had in your mind, let's just for the lack of a better word, kind of an artistic vision and you wanted to keep it about that or it was really just, you hadn't kind of realized that these two things need to go together for these sales. It was probably a combination of both. It was a little bit of resistance because after going through fashion and the production of dealing with talent and the styling and everything, I kind of was realizing that that was not part of the process that I was enjoying. Um, but when I realized that the, from the commercial side of things, I was going to need to do this to make it applicable, um, I said, okay. And so I uh, cast some people, got uh, some products together and everything, and uh, went out and started shooting in New Jersey, uh, found some abandoned um, flat car, like they're the rail cars they're designed to have, they're intermodal uh, yeah. rail cars, they're designed to get the giant containers on top of it. So they're sitting out in a uh, alongside of a road in New Jersey. So you brought talent with you dressed up? Okay. Yes, exactly. And the great thing- Industrial was, lifestyle is what you were doing, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's like industrial, you know, illustrate, because we weren't getting access to any of these like crazy places just yet. So I was setting it up to have the the view of it without necessarily having to like get through the process of what we're, what was going on. So it, while this is happening, um, the that job that I, the shoot that I was doing in New Jersey, I spotted the barge of the New York City subway cars sitting in this one yard. And I had read in the New York Times about the red birds that were being thrown overseas into the reef. And, and I the red birds is actually the name of the subway car. That was the name of the model of that subway car. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. It was the generation of subway cars because there were these iron cars that were uh, painted red. Right. And I saw this story in the New York Times and I was just like, this would have been perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so when I spotted this uh, barge with all the older but silver subway cars, I approached the guard and he was like, oh yeah, we're still doing it. We do these drops every single month. And I, you know, I was like having a hard time not shaking. You know, it's just <laughs> right, like, right, right, right. Um, who do I call? How do right, I get right, in? Can right, I go? Right. Can I? Can I? Can I? Can I? Um, so I, I approached the contractor and I told him about the recycling project. And it's like, I'd love to come in. It's not a commercial shoot. It's just, you know, a personal story that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. It's hopefully going to turn into a book sometime. And um, 
they said, yeah, that sounds great. We'd love to get you in. Let's just check with the MTA. And they were uh, good with it as well. So the MTA said yes. So they got me into the yard at 212th Street. Was that process hard just to go through the channels and stuff in this case? It was just a couple of emails and phone calls and the fact that I had to work and I was insured. And, you know, it's like, you know, here's my history and Mm -hmm, everything. mm -hmm. And so you just said an important thing. You you were insured. Yes. Okay, because that's a key thing. I've tried to get into some places. And for insurance alone, they will not let you into a lot of these places. So that's exactly. a key. Exactly. Yep. That's important. I'm sorry. It's okay. Yep. Um, <laughs> don't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, so that was the uh, beginning of the working relationship uh, with Weeks in 2008. Uh-huh. And Weeks is the name of the company that handled the uh, removal of Flight 1549 from the Hudson. Same exactly. Company. Okay. Okay. So you uh, now, ha- so you have an ongoing relationship with them now. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Ah, it's good stuff. Mm-hmm. And and all along, this is medium format work. This is this is slower procedures and, a and mixture taking your time? of everything. Okay. I was traveling with a Fuji 645 autofocus mm-hmm. uh, medium format body. I had my Hasselblad 66. I had, and then I had my Toyo 4x5, and then I also had my 1DS Mark III. Um, in a case. And so depending on what we were doing, what was changing would depend on the uh, camera right. that I was shooting on. Interesting. What are you gra- gravitating towards? I mean, I am still a Canon child. I have been on Canon for decades. Um, I am, you know, deciding on what to do for the next uh, camera systems because of uh, a bunch of my ongoing projects are now um, video related. And so mm-hmm. 4K is really important, and so and also the slow motion capabilities in Canon. Unfortunately, um, it's it's a much heavier investment with their cameras um, to get all those capabilities compared to how the Sony's have handled it. So I'm definitely eyeing the Sony, but the possibility also is just to get the uh, Blackmagic 4K and just have that as the designated mm-hmm. video system. Mm-hmm. So, and how do you keep your mind, uh, you know, clear when you when you're jumping between systems and formats? And is it? I mean, let's say for example, on on dumping a, I don't know how you want to phrase the, but the putting of the subway cars into the ocean, would it be day to day, minute to minute, shot to shot? How how do you kind of break that down? It's a it definitely increases the amount of time because you have to have a little bit of a reboot, you know, of like framing and what you're, you know, able to do and not able to do between the uh, two formats, mm-hmm. um, specific, you know, between photo and, and video. Oh, okay. Um, and, and the same for medium format and 35 millimeter or was that always uh, kind of, or today I'm going to shoot 35 millimeter because the, because the day's work calls for it. And, and tomorrow I'm going to do medium format because I can step back and take my time. It was it was based on love. If it was if it was an okay picture, it got the Fuji. Okay. If it was a you know good picture, it was Hasselblad or the uh, SLR, depending on how I was feeling. If I really liked it, right. it was four by five. Okay. So it was it, it was yes. Interesting. And I imagine Interesting. also depending on where well, you have to that, go, go ahead. To, or to what you have to do to get that shot determines what gear is going with you because you can't take everything with you to every single space you're going to be taking a picture. Exactly. You know, mm-hmm. so I imagine that's also determined. I mean, these days it is definitely trimmed down where I've got my uh, Canon 5DS. And your um, phone. No, just yes. <laughs> <laughs> six phones. Um, <laughs> they don't have the iPhone 6. I have the iPhone times six. Gotcha. <laughs> and um, what was my question going to be? Something along those lines. Um, <laughs> totally blanked it. Uh, anyway, jump in, Alan, if you have something. But yeah, my, yeah, yeah. But, um, uh, uh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. We've covered a lot of stuff here. We've covered a lot of stuff. Okay, but Jesus, mm. sorry guys. Totally so yeah, I can yeah. um I can rope in the flight fifty forty nine. Oh, we'll get there in a second. But I, I kinda wanted to stick with this idea though of how you're I mean, there's a freedom that comes with or there's a freedom allowed if you're able to kind of jump between formats and kind of decide, okay, this is the shot I want to take with a, a four by five camera. And that is a kind of a fortunate circumstance in, in the sense that you, these projects that you're doing have this freedom and this kind of uh, ability to to improvise a little bit with your with your choices no I mean is that something that you've you forced onto the situations uh, because you'd like to shoot so many different things or um, just lucky does that make sense the question yeah I mean, no it yeah. makes sense I mean I have a you know I have since retired my medium format uh, camera systems mm. um, because although I miss the optics 
um, some of the, you know, you were talking about not being able to bring everything with you at all times and everything was definitely a factor. And I found that um, on these travel jobs, I can basically do like, you know, four cases. You know, it's like a camera case, my tripods, Mm -hmm. um, everything else that I need in my life. You you appreciate what a four by five does in larger format and medium format. And there's a difference between what they will do. But something I've kind of come to grips with is that with today's camera, especially when you get past 30, 40, 50 megapixel in a 35 format, the resolving power is pretty much the same as a much larger format. I mean, I'm, I'm shooting with a Sony uh, uh, an A7R2, which is 42 megapixel. I'll put those files up against a 6 by 9 negative or transparency easily, and maybe even a bit larger, depending on how well exposed and everything else uh, is going on, what the lens is. Do you find you have a need for 4 by 5 in medium format, considering how much resolving power you get, even though there's a different look to larger format? I think that those are exactly the issues. It's just that the um, process, the experience of shooting 4 by 4 for me is so much like the aspect of being back in front of a canvas. Yes, It slows me the hell down. Um, I am much more careful about um, exposure, uh, in particular, because the latitude on the on the raw files is just so phenomenal mm-hmm. uh, these days, so I'm not, um, you know, I, I do you know strongly believe in you know shoot first and edit later. Um, four by five, I'm definitely you know thinking that you know like the goal about this is to be able to possibly bring this up to fifty by seventy or larger, um, and my digital files will do that, but I know that it's taking a little bit more work to get them there. Where versus um, my four by five film, we slap it onto the Heidelberg scanner. Oh, yeah. Um, it is a 400 megabyte, um, file. So, you know, natively it's already at that, uh, output size. Mm-hmm. Right. So, right. um, so getting back to like the, the technical aspects of it, um, it's, that was why I retired the medium format cameras. I do miss my Hasselblad lenses. I miss my 60. I miss my 50. Mm-hmm. Don't really miss my 40. It was it was pretty wide, All right. um, but I you know I missed the kachunk. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, <laughs> yeah. I did. Yeah. You know, uh, no, I actually want to get in kind of in the same vein, but not the technical aspect of it. Are you in the back of your head when you're shooting these? Is is the idea of a print always there, or is it just on some occasions? All right, this I can make a print out of a large print out of, and turn it into fine art. I mean, that's something we talked about at your show the other day when we were looking at the the shot of the. Uh, of the subway car kind of sinking into the ocean, that one that's blown up. I mean, if you're right there in front of it, that could be a fine art piece and you wouldn't even think reportage. Of course, there's other ones when, with the planes and, and it's clear that something else is going on. But are you always kind of thinking about what what can I do with this besides just demonstrating? Yeah, actually, it is in the back of my mind because, uh, you know, I now I do feel that my my main focus is being a fine art photographer, not a you know I'm not a journalist. It's like I, I'm not a documentary photographer in that sense that I actually have an you know an agenda. You know, it's like I don't get hired to go out and photograph any other uh, political environments or movements or anything. Like I'm not out on the street shooting the protests. It's like all I do is get into these industrial locations and. Um, you know, some of them are more environmentally, you know, sensitive or questionable than others. Um, I'm working on a personal project that covers the um, Superfund uh, sites in the U.S. right now and when regulations have failed. And so, uh, but also like the project that you mentioned earlier in uh, South Korea, the construction of the prelude, you know, it's the construction of a liquefied natural gas plant and it's a clean energy. But oh, they, it's a floating uh, uh Natural gas plant. Yes. Oh, I've seen it. I've seen illustrations of those. Okay. Yeah. It's, you know, those are monsters. It's an absolute monster. It is 1,600 feet in length, and it is going to be stationed off of the coast of Australia. It actually, it's already there now. It's not. I don't think it's completely operational, but they're in the process of setting it up, and it is going to be there for 25 years before it has to go back for a retrofit. And it was designed because of a natural gas reserve that was there that was too far away from land to put a pipeline in. And because it's gaseous, they needed a way to process it on site. So what they're doing is they're bringing the gas up 
chilling it, filtering it on site, and then putting it onto these custom uh, liquefied natural gas tankers, LNGs, which basically look like they have got like three giant Hershey uh, kisses on yeah, top. Yeah, yeah. So they ch- yeah, so they're chilling it uh, down to liquefy it, um, and then it's going to be put onto these uh, giant LNG tankers and um, taking uh, they're taking the fuel primarily to Hong Kong. Because they're the um, third partner in the contract assets. Shell is operating it. Hong Kong is the energy company that is the primary delivery point. And then Australia owns the land rights. So that's how everybody is funding and that's where everybody is getting their take. And is this the project that you pitched? They hired you? How how does the the setup of this work? This was a project that I pitched the New York Times magazine. Okay. And they liked the idea and we spent half a year uh, going back and forth between... Um, Shell and the shipyard were really the two people that we had to kind of talk them through it because Shell was like, this is a great project. We love it. We'll send you the photographs right now. (laughs) And they were like, no, it came from Steven, so he has to go shoot it. And they're like, Mm -hmm. okay, so Steve can come and uh, do that, but then we have to see the photographs before they get published. And the New York Times is like, no, that's not going to happen either. And they're like, Okay, so we can do this, but the shipyard has to see it before they get published. And like, no. no. <laughs> so again, you're kind of between the worlds of editorial and corporate work and your own personal projects. Yeah. So yeah. So the compromise was that they were able to. I had a safety engineer from the shipyard. I had someone from Shell um, keeping an eye on what I was, you know, shooting. So basically, if you know, they didn't want the engineering that was uh, happening to the left. They're saying, don't shoot that direction. And that was the extent that they were allowed to kind of control it. Then I would just go like click and they would never notice. Right. But that would actually. <laughs> no, but that's interesting. Be- and that goes back to what format you're using too, because you couldn't do that if you were setting up a, a medium format shot. But with your 35, you can. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I think that that was part of it. It's like I have gotten into the situation where I've got very limited amount of time on these locations, even though I had a week um, before that ship. As we were saying, it's a, you know, 15 story ship that has three construction elevators mounted to the side of the ship. It is not functioning. So it's like when you get up to the top deck and you turn to your assistant and say, where's the other lens? They're like, oh, I left it in the car. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an hour Hour later. Yeah, (laughs) Um, (laughs) It wasn't a lens. It was a GoPro. But anyway. You still can't get over that. I have not. (laughs) (laughs) Um, By the way, you mentioned GoPro. Uh, What other, aside from normal cameras, are you using drones and things of that sort for your work now? Um, We are starting to uh, fly a little bit. I'm in the process of getting certified. I'm very, very excited about the uh, the quality of the drones that is uh, hitting the market. So yes, you're going to be seeing it from me um, almost definitely in 2019. Your subject matter, I mean, that's a natural for it. I mean, that adds such a dimension to what you can do. I completely agree. And I was actually hoping to bring a drone in 2014 to South Korea, but the film crew that was working with Shell had already brought their drone out mm. and then it crashed. Uh, and Shell said no more drones. Interesting. Wow. Well, you know, well, that's uh, funny. Actually, our gift to you today is a uh, brand new drone. <laughs> yeah, we give one to all of our guests. Mm. You didn't I, know that? I know. I knew it. And I didn't yeah. want to bring it up yet that you're <laughs> yeah, getting yeah. me the DJI um, yeah, the Mavic Pro 2. Mavic Pro yeah. 2. Yes, yes, sure yes. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we sent it Do out for them. engraving, so it's going to be a few months. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, let Watch me, your mailbox. Before we jump into the, the 1549 questions, I want to ask one more question about um, the work you're doing now. And you said you kind of came out of school thinking more about fashion. Uh, ha, do you look back to some of the... Because there's kind of a great tradition of industrial photography that blends itself into fine artwork, you know, from, well, I guess, trains, O. Winston Link, I mean, W. Gene Smith, Charles Sheeler. There's a long list, you know, even Walker Evans, you know. Do you look to any of that stuff? Do you do you look back to some of the masters for inspiration? The Beckers who photographed all of those? The Beckers uh, for that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, sure. yeah. yeah that's it's exactly the same stuff. Not as much as I should. Mm-hmm. Um, I am familiar with the work. Uh, I... I'm inspired by them and some of my other uh, contemporaries, um, particularly you got Berdinsky. Your own eyes, though. Who, who, who is I'm Edward, just Edward Berdinsky? Okay, um, yeah, yeah. definitely. You know, always amazed. He is a wonderful artist. He's an uh, absolute gentleman as well, and is like very supportive of the photo community that he is in Toronto and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I've just got nothing but you know great things to say to uh, about him and his work. That's great. But, uh, We're gonna take a short break. Stay tuned. We 
We hope you're enjoying this edition of the BH Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. All right, we are back and we are joined by Denise Lockie, who was seated in C2C on that fateful day on flight 1549. Um, to kind of get in the mood with things, we uh, during the break, we had the studio flooded with four feet of ice water. So if you hear some teeth chatter, we're just trying to keep things realistic here. <laughs> like, <laughs> welcome, Denise. I hope that joke didn't go over too bad with you. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Do you have an aversion to ice water since then? I mean, I, I imagine you have certain fears in you since that all that happened. I have absolutely no aversion to ice water in my cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> However, I choose not to become a polar bear and go out into the water when it's 35 or 36 degrees. I, I, I can tell you that away. I remember that day very clearly because I, I was coming to the Andes and amphibious rescue craft were blowing down 34th Street and sirens were all over the place. We knew something was going on. Came up here was told that a plane is in the Hudson and it was so cold. I said, it must be awesome, but it's just too cold out there. And I'm, I'm sitting opposite you and I really should just shut up because yeah. <laughs> you're just there. <laughs> I cannot first. imagine that. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> before, before we get into that, I just want to catch up with, with uh, uh, um, Stephen on how you got to do this photography of the plane and, and how soon after the plane hit the river did you show up? I actually, I arrived the day after. Um, what had happened was... You should check your messages. <laughs> you gotta check your phone. Okay. Yeah, well, it was a pager at the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, um, for, so as we were saying earlier, I had started working with Weeks in uh, 2008 uh, with the subway car project. Yes. And then... Uh, they had also told me that they were scrapping a ferry out in Weehawken at one point, and I went and photographed that. And then a uh, little bit uh, along the way and everything, my uh, contact at Weeks gives me a phone call, and he's like, oh, I don't know if you're interested, but tomorrow we're picking up the Concorde. And so they oh, commissioned so for me to oh, follow yeah. the Concorde um, getting put back to the Intrepid, which had been docked out at uh, right. um Staten Island for four years for the retrofit. So it was just coming back. And so I went with the Concord with Weeks. Um, and that was when I met Tom Weeks, um, who's the uh, son of the original, you know, it's a family owned business. I mean, Tom Founder, Weeks was yeah. the main, mm -hmm. main opera, main guy. And so we met. And so January 15th rolls around. It's my wife's birthday. We're sitting at a bar, uh, toasting her, watching this. And, you know, the news is coming in that everybody survived. And this was huge. And it was the first, and I didn't know it at the time, but it was the first, you know, emergency ditching slash crash in a <laughs> um, body of water with a jet-powered uh, commercial aircraft where everybody survived. And so, you know, that was just huge news. And so everybody's, you know, celebrating, you know, the miracle on the Hudson starts becoming the name, circling around it and everything. Um, and at one point, I, I still, you know, I'm not sure if it was the voice in my head or my wife. She said it was, said it was her and I think it was me. But, you know, at some <laughs> some voice said, I wonder how they're going to get the airplane out of the water. Yeah. And I was just, just like, I know who's going to do this. Yeah. Because we had this giant rotating crane on the Eastern Seaboard. And so um, at that moment, I called my contact and he didn't pick up the phone. But he called me back in a couple of hours and is like, I don't know if, we're, um, if we've got the project yet. I am having a meeting with the Coast Guard and the FBI at like 10, 10 tomorrow morning. I'm going to know if we're doing the project or not. And it's like, I won't be able to pick up the phone because of that meeting, but call um, Tom Weeks because he always answers his phone. This is before all the robot calls and people mm -hmm. would like actually answer your phone <laughs> um, and just remind him, you know, when you guys met and ask him. And so I called him and was like, hey, you know, Tom? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, hey, it's Steve Mellon, the photographer. Oh, yeah, hey, we met, we met in the Concord job. And he's like, oh, yeah, what's up? And he's like, did you get the project? And he's like, what project? Well, the, the, the plane in the river? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we got it. Do you want to work? <laughs> <laughs> and I had prepped for this. Um, all the equipment was ready. I was in my office at Union Square at the uh -huh. time and jumped into my car, punched in the address into my brand new GPS, uh -huh. and immediately got lost in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, made it back out to their yard in time, got onto a boat, and then arrived um, with the first crane that they uh, brought out to the site uh, the day after. Wow. Well, well, okay. And this was, and then you went from there, basically, is whatever image you could get. I mean, there, you were on your own. Was there any kind of uh, input from the authorities around and the teams and stuff like that? It was, yeah, I was pretty much on my own at the time. I, uh, 
I arrived and I was in, you know, my life jacket and a hard hat, my tripod and my camera. And I just started uh, gathering images mm-hmm. of the crew. You know, there's a photograph uh, online in the catalog of the um, Airbus engineers holding up a model aircraft from U.S. Airways discussing what the <laughs> center of gravity was. And it was just by they had landed in LaGuardia and went to the toy store and actually found a U.S. Airways wow. Airbus 320 That's in the funny. gift store and like huh. brought that to like talk to the operators about like where the center of gravity of the mm-hmm. aircraft um, was going to be, where it was designed to be, but it's like full of water, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and missing one engine. Mm-hmm. Um, so, right, right. based on a model made in China by people who never saw the real thing. Okay, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, there's a there's a process. Um, <laughs> but and basically, this was you know you're there for these many days in the cold every day, gathering as much as you can. So the. Uh, on the pier was uh, essentially two days. It was the okay. first day when we arrived, and I stayed there till you know 10, 11 o'clock at night, got back the next morning, and then stayed uh, there from 9 a.m. through midnight. And mm-hmm. they pulled the aircraft out uh, about midnight, 12.30 that mm-hmm. night, and then towed it back over to uh, their pier in New Jersey. And then you followed it down to Charlotte, too? or So no? I, I didn't follow no. it to Charlotte. It stayed. It, um, it went there, and then... Um, they spent about a week and a half pulling stuff basically off of the aircraft. They immediately uh, took off the second engine, and mm-hmm. GE took that back to Ohio to take a look at it. They already knew it was a bird strike. Right. They already like they knew they just couldn't announce it yet. Right. Um, but they then you know they were collecting stuff out of this, and things you can talk a little bit about this and what didn't get pulled off <laughs> or did and never recovered. Um, and then they but they um, they took off the tail. They took off the wings. Um, because there's no other way to transport, transport it. Right. And then they put it onto these custom hydraulic trailers. And then um, due to the um, height of some of those New Jersey bridges that we were talking about, um, they weren't able to take it along the fastest route and had to actually go through Jersey City and then all the way north up to um, basically past Teterboro where they well, might have, have landed, yeah, yeah, might have landed. You know, yeah. um, I mean, he made the right decision. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm never, yeah, never questioning. No, 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 no. <laughs> so when you were there shooting, though, were you? I mean, were there other photographers on site? There must have been news guys around. Uh, were you? Did were you thinking? Okay, I, I'm going to create some beautiful images here or was it as much about or as much about capturing as much as possible and a combination it was it was a combination of both mm-hmm. i always wanted to make sure that the that weeks's work was Your client documented comes first sure and but i also was you know wanted to make sure that what i was coming away with from this was going to be unique that it was mm-hmm. not just a Newspaper esque photograph, a like, documentation of mm-hmm. a exactly. project. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So I started, there had to be an you know, interpretation because of my, you know, background and focus on the landscape, and the industrial work, and everything that I did. Is you know, it's still like, all right, how do we, you know, how do we frame this? How do we, mm-hmm. you know, visualize this? Now we've like got all those things that were happening quickly covered. Now let's go back and find these like more unique uh, moments. Mm-hmm. Um, and just also, you know, just stay in like, you know, what's happening next, you know, mm-hmm. asking, you know, when are the divers going in the water? When are they, you know, what's the process? What's the schedule like? And, you know, so just kind of kept on staying informed with the, uh, with the engineers and, uh, with NTSB and the FBI and like those water cannons and mm-hmm. like, yeah, well it is still full of fuel, so it could possibly still blow up at mm-hmm. any point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, the, the flash point was low. It was super cold. They weren't really worried. Cause I mean, if they were worried, we wouldn't have been there, yeah, cleared, yeah, but yeah. they still literally mm-hmm. put up all these water cannons just in case something sparked when they pulled it out or at any point. Um, well, it's all unknowns. Yeah. yeah. It's all unknowns. Well, so the last question for yeah. Stephen and Michibor, and, and this is, I mean, this is in the days right after. The news is clear that everyone has survived, but it's still a very emotional and dramatic time. Did you, was that, uh, were you feeling that all the time? Was that something that weighed on you when you were shooting it? Or did you realize that, wow, I have this moment in history and, or was it just a job, you know, it wasn't just a job, but was it, uh, did you approach it the way you might have approached other jobs? Or did this, the fact of what just happened was constantly there? It was definitely on my mind. And I also just remembered, you know, when everybody, you know, when we're there and like guys are around sometimes, we're kind of just like, there's a plane right there yeah. in the Hudson River under us, next to us, and it's all okay, and it worked. And so, yes, it was it was very freaky, um, you know, to see this, like, wounded animal in the water, but um, it was there. So, Denise, one of many questions. You're a passenger. You're minding your own business. You're sitting on a plane. It's a boring—you're just going back to Charlotte. Okay. 
Plane takes off, it's a gorgeous day. All of a sudden there's a bang, there's a silence. And now all of a sudden everyone's getting kind of freaked out because you're flying thousands of feet above the Manhattan. All of a sudden you are level to it and going below and you're going into the water and you know it. You hit, bounce, come back down, comes to, and the plane starts filling with water and people have to get out. I'm not even going to attempt to put my head where your head must have been. It's impossible. But the question I have is that you get out and you're standing on this wing and you're, you just survived a plane crash. You're in the middle of the Hudson River standing on the wing of a plane. You're out of this craft that is starting to submerge. And then somebody says, jump in the water. Did you pause? Because I don't know if I'm standing on a wing and I'm secure. I don't know if I'm going back in the water that is so cold on a horribly cold day. I what actually, did you do? I actually didn't go out on the wing. I went out of the slide raft that was upside down. Oh, so you had no choice. I had no choice, and I actually was very calm at that moment, but my slide raft did not deploy properly, so it was upside down. So when I went out with the help from my seatmate who pushed me without my glasses, I went right into the water, and it was bone-chilling cold. It was the coldest moment I've ever recalled in my entire life. I couldn't even breathe. It was so cold. It, yeah, it, it locks you up. I mean, totally. Mm -hmm. How long were you actually in the water before you were pulled out? I was in the water approximately, to my knowledge, because I have a complete absence of memory from a certain time. And I just found out last year that the boat that I was on was the last boat that picked up the last passengers. So I was one of the last passengers that was actually picked up and transported over to New Jersey. So I have to guesstimate it was probably between 15 to 20 minutes. I really don't know. There's no time stamp. But I do recall trying to get up on the rope ladder endlessly and tirelessly, and I couldn't do it because I could oh, not geez. grasp because my hands were frozen and my feet were frozen. It just saps your, your strength. I, I had, mean, it's, it's I had nothing, no energy whatsoever. And the other passengers that were coming down the slide raft in, in a similar situation, my first thought process was the people that were actually swimming in the water and trying to get them to come over to the raft so we could get them on and hopefully save some lives because we obviously didn't know the extent of what was going on. And there was a lot of things going on in my mind during that time. There was a lot of different ups and downs. Mm. Okay, did I just survive a plane crash? Am I going to drown? Right. Are we going to explode? What about the other passengers? How can we make this a much more positive situation than what I perceived as dire? Mm -hmm. At what point did you come to grips that you're okay and you survived? Because just because you're out on the wing or in the water or, or in the raft or whatever, it's not over. I mean, at what point did you say, I made it? I think when I was finally taken over to the triage area and we walked in and they approached every passenger and they put body tags on us. And since I hadn't been familiar with a body tag, I had to look at it without glasses. I was trying to figure it out. And I remember seeing a black section, which is not a good section to see. Yeah. And I remember a lot of the first responders coming over and asking how I was doing. And I said, well, I'm fine. I'm fine. And they said, well, you have to take off all your clothes. And I was very shy. And they took up a, sh a sheet, just a regular bed sheet, and put it around me. And they said, no, you have to take off everything. So I was standing in a room with hundreds of people, stark naked. And they said, how's your foot? And I said, it's great. How's your leg? Perfect. <laughs> How are you feeling? Great. Wonderful. They said, well, why don't you look at your leg? And I, I said, it's fine. So the next thing I knew, a doctor came over who I didn't know was a doctor at that time. And she started asking me questions again. They were doing my blood pressure and everything else. How's your leg? Oh, it's fine. Oh, are you sure? I said, yeah, it's fine. And all of a sudden, a gurney comes over, and they slap me on the gurney. My ankle was about four times the normal size, black and blue from here, from my hip all the way down to my ankle. Mm. So I didn't realize that I had sustained some injuries 
because obviously my adrenaline was. Uh, you were in shock, is what I guess you. Were. Of course I was. Yeah, I mean that's. <laughs> it's, I guess that's a good definition. Yeah, shock. I was in shock. And was there a, when along the, in this process did you have a sense that peop, most people or everybody had survived? Was that even made aware to you until later? Absolutely not. I had absolutely yeah. no idea. I had no abs. No idea if it was a bird strike. I had always, in my back of my mind, I thought it was another 9-11. Right. That was the first thing that came to mind. Right. I did not know if there were survivors. I did not know that there were people all over greater Manhattan, New Jersey. I thought we were all in the same place. I had no communication. I had had an old flip phone and a BlackBerry for work. And by the way, did you find my BlackBerry? Because I still- I tried. Okay. Was it, it wasn't where you said it was going to be. <laughs> um, I'm still looking for my wallet, my BlackBerry, and a couple other miscellaneous okay. items. We'll give you a cap fair when some shows over. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, I, I'd appreciate that. But I did have a flip phone, which I normally never would have had on me, but I'd put it underneath my sweater that mm-hmm. I was wearing. And, and actually, it was damaged, but I was able to make a couple of phone wow. calls until it went dead. So I, I had no communication when I called my family. I called my sister. We were disconnected. She was the opth- ophthalmologist. She didn't believe me. Oh, hung up Did she on have me. any clue of what happened? Did she know about it? Absolutely no. none. Whoa. A- absolutely none. And then I called her back, and she actually left the ophthalmologist and drove home with her eyes dilated. And by the time she made it home, being an ex-New Yorker, there was a large news media channel in front of my family's home <laughs> waiting for her and we kept it hidden from my father because mm. he was in his 90s and he knew that I flew that every week and he kept saying as soon as the breaking news hit was your sister on that plane and we of course didn't tell him right away mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, how did he react when he found out um, I told him the next morning, and he said, well, I had a feeling you were on the plane. <laughs> Parents. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I told you never to fly. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> well, I, I had to tell him because course, he, he got yeah. up early in the morning, and he watched the Today Show every day, yeah. and I knew that I was going to be on as one of the feature guests. And yeah. I said, well, Dad, Matt Lauer is going to be interviewing me. Mm. And he said, well, why is that? And I said, well... You'll see, Dad. Mm. Well, so by the next day, you were able to speak with people and have interviews, or that was a couple days later? No, that was actually the morning after. Um, Had it not been for the network news, I really don't know where I would have wound up. Mm -hmm. When I was transported to the hospital after the initial assessment in New Jersey, I was all about going home or... Mm -hmm doing something. I had no idea. Uh, the airlines have what they ha- have some type of plan. I'm not certain what they call it. I just was leaving in a gurney with another passenger going to a hospital, right. unaware of where I was going. I didn't have anything, literally. Mm-hmm. No ID, one shoe, no glasses, nothing. No lipstick. Mm-hmm. All the important things right. that you think about when you're <laughs> going to the hospital. Going right. to the hospital. Uh, no ID. No right. money. Nothing. Absolutely right. nothing. Except right. the clothes on my back that they had taken away from me. Right. So there was a young lady running down the street after the ambulance, and she said, "Matt Lauer would like to talk to you." And I said, "Oh, really? Me?" And she said, "Yes." So she threw her business card and she actually followed the ambulance. And had she not, I really don't know what would have happened that night because she waited in the hospital all night until I was released and actually got a black car, brought me into Manhattan about 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning, put me into a hotel. They picked me up by another black car later on and took me over to the studio. I literally was in shock. Yeah. And had it not been for them, I really don't know who would have been my sponsor, if you right. will. Would have taken care of you. Yeah, yeah. you need yeah. Yeah, you need a set of eyes. Sure. There was nobody there. Right. Okay. I'm still See, waiting. Now, you're, <laughs> oh, still waiting. you're still in <laughs> touch still with a, a lot of the, your the passengers from that flight. Um, did everybody have sort of have similar experience to that? Were there some people who were taken away and they just felt like they were just deserted? I. I or like you said, that you want, you don't. If it wasn't for this one person, you don't know where you would have been. Did anybody? Did everybody sort of have a watchful eye? 
well, the guardian angel, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting because airlines have contingency plans. And whether or not they are effective, we don't know. I mean, how can I compare this to anything? Mm. All I know is that the airlines put together 100 plus personnel from their corporate offices. They had a special route to come right into New York because that wasn't a normal route for U.S. Airways. And they came here with a lot of um, publicity, if you will, letting them know that they were here for the passengers. I was a frequent flyer. I was at the top of the food chain with the airlines. And I was a little concerned because I hadn't been contacted by anybody. Mm -hmm. And so that was a little unusual. Some people had great experiences. Some had zero experiences. Some people just walked away from the scene, literally. Mm -hmm. When they got to shore, they just walked away. So there was really no way of checking the manifest which is rather unusual if you're in a major carrier plane yeah, crash. Right, right. You'd think they would contain sure. all the passengers to get a count. So it, it, it's, it's different. It was a very unique experience. At what point did they know that they had all 155 people accounted I, for? I'm not 100% certain. I went to the NTSB hearings for three and a half days. I believe it was probably three hours afterwards. But that wasn't really confirmed, confirmed because the airlines did not reach out to every individual passenger. Because, right. again, literally people got to the shore and walked away. Walked home or wherever. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Jesus. Um, so maybe we can like fast forward a little bit. Like you, the initial trauma is, is past you, your home. Weeks or months have gone by. And did you not, did you purposely not pay attention or think about it as much as possible? And then... If so, when was the time where you said, okay, now I, I need to go back and, and, and look at everything or, or look at images and photos and videos and talk to people? That's a great question. Um, when I came home, it was we all remember the crash, the market crash in 2008. And I had just been acquired by a company and it became official January 1. So this was my second trip of the year. I compartmentalized everything. Mm. I came home on Saturday. I went to work on Monday without any tools, and I had to cancel my trips that week because I had no identification, and I had to get oh, everything yeah. replaced. So I put everything in this little place in my brain, and my sister started collecting everything. I was inundated with interviews and television appearances and news media. So I would do that on the side. So I really became aware but I always, in the back of my mind, my career was so important to me, I just wouldn't talk about the real life issues or the real life trauma that I was personally having. To give you an example, the first time I took a hot shower a few days later when I was home alone, I closed my eyes in the shower and I had a flashback. Mm -hmm. So I had to deal with that, but I internalized it. I didn't share it with people. And learning later on, you have to share. You have to be very, very open about it. And I became more engaged with other passengers and learning more and more. And I, of course, went and saw professional help. But I still kept it very personal, extremely personal. When my employer would ask me to do things, I would do it. I never said no. Uh, I just made sure that I was on top of my game because mm -hmm. I didn't want to lose my job on top of right. going through this incredible experience. But I was always in the background looking in. But then I would make sure that when I was working, whether it was social, professional, that I was doing it right. So I'd have to check and recheck and then check again, not because I'm ADD, but I just wanted to make sure that my words and my thought process was really what it was because I was questioning everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very different. How yeah. long did it take you to get beyond all that? Because that's, that's, that's a lot. And I, I, I don't know how well I would uh, survive something like that. You know, at what point did things get normal again, quote unquote? Did you, <laughs> or have they? I have um, a better control. I'm not going to say that I don't have moments where I can become a little bit anxious or a little bit super sensitive, but I am a very mellow person. 
And since I'm a fixer, I try to be the most positive person in the mm -hmm. room. I try to make everybody happy. But I also understand the emotionals impact of everything that happened. I think that this will be with me for the rest of my life, but I know how to manage it mm -hmm. totally. What about flights? Are you able to get on a plane right now? Do you have your own little checklist that you go right now? Do you keep an extra <laughs> pair of black glasses black. in your sweater? <laughs> <laughs> Waterproof phone? Just like your flip Backup phone. lipstick. Like flip phone. <laughs> <laughs> I've flown, oh, probably close to 800 plus times since okay. the incident. And now that I'm back in the air, absolutely, I have a checklist. I have a system. I'm very systematic. I have to pick out my seat. It has to be on the right side of the aircraft so I can see the flight crew. I have regimented process for my own safety and for the safety of others around me. So, yes. And then I also had the choice whether or not I'm feeling a little off, which is not very often. I can choose not to get on the plane. I'm not going to get on a plane in the middle of a storm where they're saying there's 10-hour delays and you may or may not and the winds are going to be excessive and so on and so forth. I'm just not going to do that. It's not worth it to do it to myself, and I'm not going to do it to my friends. So why why bother? I'll get I'll catch the next flight. The, yeah. Do the airlines cooperate with you based on your history when you say, I'm not going on that flight? Because I mean, they could easily just say, well, you don't have to, and you're paying for the flight anyway. Do they... Cut you some slack? Um, they used to when I was uh, chairman's preferred with the airlines. Now that I'm not at the top of the food chain, it's a little bit different. Even despite the fact that you went through what you went through, they should have a little bit of consideration. Well, we, we would like that. We would like to see some consideration. <laughs> John, put a call out. What would you please say after yeah. the show? Huh? You know what I want is I want to laminate your checklist so I've got my own safety right. card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this weekend is the, the – or Tuesday is the 10th anniversary. This weekend you're here to meet with other folks who are on the, the flight and get together and share memories and hugs and laughs. And, I mean, it's pretty – it's to say, very unique situation. It's so, a unique club. Yeah, you're looking forward to it. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful time. Uh, what's your I, hopes? I'm thrilled. This yeah. is our 10th anniversary. Our, we go to the same restaurant. Mm. And I think tomorrow night is going to be really, really special because we have first responders coming. Uh -huh. We have a diver coming who's never been before. We have a passenger that's never been before. And if we get one passenger every year that has chosen to stay away for various reasons to bring them to us as a family, we are very, very happy. Imagine. So we drink excessively, we mm -hmm. party excessively, mm -hmm. we talk, we cry, we laugh, we share memories. We're one big happy family. And is, this is just an oddball question. Were, have any couples or marriages uh, <laughs> kind of developed from the people that were on that flight together or any long-term relationships other than through the, the bonding a, of this? Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. There's been Jay, do you have any newlywed music back the <laughs> theme song? And any divorces? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, actually, good question. Yes. Nah. Go ahead. Here, here comes a bride. There has been some you know, family indifferences. There has been some divorces. Mm -hmm. There has been couples that met on the plane that dated for a while that are no longer no longer together. I've attended three passengers' weddings. Mm -hmm which has been terrific. They're part of my family. And of course, career changes, children. We've got such a huge population of children mm -hmm. from people that were on the plane. There was a couple, two couples actually, that got married and they have their families now. So mm -hmm. you think back and say, well, what if? And now we know that they're very, very happy and they came to New York that weekend and got married and now they have their families. Wow. Well, Out of all the passengers that you're still in touch with, again, this is a life-changing situation that you go through. I don't think anybody walks away from this unchanged in some way. What would what would be the most dramatic change you saw in a passenger that they've gone through? Anybody make some real serious – I'm not talking about a divorce, but a real serious major change, total direction in their life? Anybody, any? Yes. Yes. I think um, there are some passengers that have been – severely affected by this incident that will never fly again mm -hmm. and have had challenges just facing the reality. Not everybody was an avid flyer like myself. Not everybody got on a plane every week. There were a lot of mixed emotions. So some people have 
post-traumatic stress, and that's something that we always reserve for the military. And I think that when Captain Sullenberger finally came out a few years back and started addressing post-traumatic stress, that made it okay for us. Mm. He's, he admitted he was frightened. Yes. I mean, as cool as a cucumber yeah. as he was, he admitted he was scared. Yeah. But until he mentioned post-traumatic stress, I think we as passengers did never want to utilize that terminology because we didn't feel as though we were actually in that category. You went through a That's serious enough, trauma. Yeah. But yeah, we do associate it with military. But yeah. listen to what the words are. That's what you went through. Yeah. Yeah. Needless to say. Yeah. 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 And I imagine there may be some, and this goes, and we could talk about this forever, and, and this kind of goes deep into it, but there must be that counter argument, which is, well, everybody survived. You know, you should be happy. You know, it should all be about good things, right? Yeah. And needless to say, that's not the case. We hear that a lot. And yeah. I've heard, you know, we hear different things from different people. And I think one of the things, and I can speak for the entire group, we have 147 passengers still with us mm -hmm. and five crew members. We've lost three passengers. And the worst thing that we here is get over it. Yeah, of course. Because that's a little bit insensitive. And you know, I just want to just kind of roll that in because during the first year when I was still on an emotional roller coaster and not knowing from one day to the next, I remember calling Steve. I was in New York for business and I had extended my weekend. He had his breakout moment. And I remember calling and leaving a voicemail asking if I could attend a gallery event. And I don't even know if I addressed myself as a passenger. And I didn't know if I was being intrusive. I was pretty shy and timid when I reached out to him. I remember the hotel I was staying at. I remember exactly what I did that entire day and getting the nerve to call him up to ask him, would it be okay if I come over and look at the pictures. Do you remember that? I do. And it was so sweet and touching, actually, because I remember recalling to ask if it would be okay to be there. And I also remember, you know, you know, it's like I called the gallery and it's like, what if the passengers call? They're, they're, they're coming, you know, because we didn't know what your reaction was going to be, you know, of, you know, how you were going to relate to the work. So when you reached out and your reaction was so thankful about seeing this and having this, you know, these, my photographs as part of the experience was really, to this day, still touching. And we went out for Chinese afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's New York. What else would you be doing? And I met a great bunch of people and I split my pants. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to bring it up on the podcast. <laughs> oh, what the heck? <laughs> it was it's reality. Exactly. <laughs> Thank goodness you know I what? Had a if you can survive a plane crash, split pants, mm -hmm. psh, nonsense. So <laughs> let, let's talk about that then. What, what, when you see the. Not, not the talk pants. about the pants. <laughs> 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 um, so what do you see what do you think when you see the images and Stevens of course but also I mean there, there's the famous image of the photo I guess which is actually a take from a video of the passenger standing on the on the wing and, and that seems to be the, like the iconic image of the day do you avoid them do you look at them do you what do you think well the one that the closed cap or the closed whatever it's called the CCTV mm-hmm I had never seen the entirety of that until this year because mm -hmm. there's a much longer version. And when I saw the longer version, it was extremely emotional because I've never seen it on a public site before because I thought I had captured every image and every video and everything else. And, of course, uh, the, the famous, famous image that went out on Twitter. I always look at it and I think... The reality versus what you see as an image, you know, how fast were we when we hit the water? And a lot of people think by looking at the video, we were just cruising, you know, hitting the water about 20 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, it was a pontoon boat. It was just a, yeah. uh, it was a Sunday afternoon. Exactly. Yeah. And the images going over the GW and driving over the GW the first time after for me and, Jeez, you know, yeah. just freezing right. and thinking. What was the speed? Because I remember, I think it was somewhere between 150, 
150 miles an hour that you hit the water, and the aircraft, the airframe was rated to survive 90. Wow. So it, wow. you know, the engineering above and beyond. Went above and beyond. Yeah. And also, regarding the bridge, the, as the plane curved toward the river, it, it was only several hundred feet above yeah. the bridge. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. And in my mind... And I've st- I probably told this story many, many times. In my mind, I was trying to convince myself that we were going back to LaGuardia mm. in a roundabout way. Right. Yeah. And you we were take gonna, the Holland Tunnel. We were going to take <laughs> yeah. the Holland Tunnel. <laughs> yep. And we were going to run. We were going to get there, but we were going to be short of the runway. Mm. And I knew one way or the other, I'm going to have to do a short swim. Mm. <laughs> that was my in my mind. mind yeah. Yeah. I was very content. I was. Very calm and very content. When they took my blood pressure, they were shocked because it huh. was just totally normal. But I had an emergency landing four months after out of LaGuardia. After? I was going to San Francisco via Charlotte, and I was on a small regional, mm-hmm. and they forgot to close some of the compartments. So we had to fly around Connecticut, and I was a little tense. Yeah. I'm not going to deny it. Oh, I was a little mm-hmm. tense, an emergency landing, and you're coming in, you see all the equipment and mm-hmm. I we had to walk off the aircraft but I was lucky enough because back then I I was an important customer to the airline they had some of the people waiting for me to get me on my flight to San Francisco without going through Charlotte cuz obviously we had been delayed for a few hours burning off some fuel mm-hmm. so I had that same feeling but I was comforting the passenger sitting next to me and in Good front of me right because I figured there's no way this but did, is not going to happen. I'm sorry, but did you explain to them who you were at that point and what you've been through, or was uh, it necessary? <laughs> sometimes I tell people, right. but sometimes a lot of times Wouldn't I matter. don't say anyway, anything. Right? What would it matter? At but that I always point? tell people yeah. it's okay. We're going to be okay. Yeah. They know what they're doing. Yeah. Good for you. How Good do you, you know? Because well, yeah. I've been here before, <laughs> and it was heard? much worse last time. <laughs> I, wear, I, wear my, I, I wear my hat. I wear my Sully hat. Oh, okay. There you go. I can't, <laughs> not very often, but occasionally I do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I wear my Sully hat. So let me jump over to, to seeing Stephen's photos again, because to some degree, these photos are... Um, there are happy photos. There are kind of there's kind of a, there's some some glory going on, and there's and you know I don't I don't know what the right word is, but there's uh, well I would say you celebratory. Celebrate. Thank you. That yeah. is the word. Perfect. Thank you. So, do you feel that a little bit? Do you, do they give you a bit of peace? Do they set you back to a, a scary moment? Or what? What are your thoughts on on his photos, which are obviously after the fact? Oh, I think his photos bring me complete peace of mind. Mm which probably would be unusual to some passengers. I just look at it and and put the reality into perspective and look at every detail, you know, the photo of the engine, because people always said, well, there wasn't a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Take a look. I've had the opportunity, and you probably saw the inside afterwards, and it was not pretty. I'm sure. It was not pretty looking at my seat and seeing it disruptive and still looking for that. Blackberry and my glasses, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. not there, but <laughs> you'll get them one day. <laughs> yeah, didn't he, I mean, I was I was inside the aircraft when I was up on the pier. And TSB was kind enough to let me in, and so I was the first like professional photographer inside of the aircraft. And uh, it was, you know, it was spooky. You know, I was like inside of the cockpit, and there's that photograph of the, you know, yeah. of the controls of the throttle, and you know, I I was, you know not touching it, you know, it was kind of very protective of, you know, it's like, even though it's like, there's like mud streaks on it from being in the Hudson River and sinking at one point, mm. but it was... Uh, you know how deep it was at that, where, where it rested? It wasn't too deep because it, it's, it sank because the rope had broken where they tied it to on the pier. Okay. So, it, what, you know, whatever the depth is on the shallow side of the Hudson River. 30, like, 40 feet, something like that. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know that the engine that separated was deeper than that because the center of the Hudson was down below um, 50 feet, which is why um, the New York um, NYPD's divers did not want to do it because it was it was a compression issue mm-hmm. at that point, which is why they, they sent weeks back in to get the uh, the, the engine out. Mm-hmm. Um, that came more from the impact, right? Yeah, it snapped off. They're designed to. <clears throat> yeah. Do you plan to have a Stephen Mallon image uh, purchased and bought in your home? Do you celebrate the... The wing picture. Yeah, I mean... I, I have to have the wing picture. Uh-huh. I, I do. I mean, I've wanted it for 10 years, uh-huh. and I absolutely have to have it. And okay. there will be a time 
that I will have the picture. Right, right. I mean, we've talked about it, right. and because it gives me great peace. And this is what I'm getting at. Yeah, and yeah. I do have to have it. It's it's something that I'm going to have to save my pennies for and and get it because it does bring me such great inner peace. And every time I remember the very first time I saw it, how I felt. And every time I've seen it since, actually, I just put it up on my Facebook page. I asked his permission because once again, it gives me that inner peace. You know, people sometimes, because we're all into social media today, we didn't have social media back then. And they probably always think, oh, here she goes again. It's that time of the year. It must be coming up to the anniversary. Well, this is not something I'm going to drop because this yeah. is our 10th anniversary. I'm going to continue this every January 15th till the day I die. As you should. As I should. Yeah, especially Absolutely. with the yeah. attitude that you have. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I imagine there's many passengers who would never want to look at anything yeah. regarding this, but I think yeah. it's healthy what you're... It's very healthy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's very Few healthy. Few of them actually have uh, purchased uh, prints. Yeah, they. yeah the, this, um, the image of the cockpit uh, throttle... And then there's one other image uh, titled Portal, mm -hmm. which is not in the current show, but it's a photograph of the tray. And it's just the water droplets um, oh, and nice. everything. And there's no real reference. You do, very few people can identify it at their uh, first moment. But those three pictures are the primary ones that the collectors, uh, that the passengers have purchased. The other mm -hmm. images have sold periodically to New Yorkers. Um, one of the first images that we sold when we were in Miami originally in 2009 uh, was the image of it coming out of the water at night. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a fashion guy, uh -huh. um, actually a designer <laughs> from, uh, <laughs> came by the booth in Miami and was like, oh, wow, that's cool. Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Not knowing necessarily. I, I think, was, no, I think he, he did know that it was right. New York connected. Cause yeah, it was, yeah. And I always just love the fact, because the gallery at the time was in Williamsburg, uh -huh. and he was in so -so Soho, and it, it took us meeting in Miami because we couldn't get them over the Williamsburg Bridge. Right. But <laughs> <laughs> out of Miami. Uh, right. Yes. <laughs> cool. Yeah, Stephen, um, people want to catch up on your work and see some of this stuff. Where should they go? So the current exhibition is up at uh, Front Room Gallery in the Lower East Side at 48 Hester. Mm -hmm. So the show is going to be uh, up until February 24th. Mm -hmm. uh, at the gallery. The uh, next exhibition after that is going to be uh, just on the artificial reef project that I did in conjunction with the MTA. And that will be showing at uh, the New York Transit Museum's uh, annex space at Grand Central Terminal mm -hmm. opening March 20th. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, That's going to be interesting. And website and Instagram? Website and Instagram, stephenmellon.com, mellonfilms.com. And it's uh, 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 S-T-E-P-H-E-N. Get it right. That's right. That's right. Not <laughs> Stephen, Stephen. And, and the better Stephens are with the PH. That's right. Yeah, yeah, the better ones. <laughs> yes. And Stephen Mellon Photography and Mellon Films. And everything. So feel free to reach out if you got any questions. Yeah, Always wonderful. happy. Okay. I look forward to that the the Transit Museum show because I really that's the first series I saw of yours and I really think it's pretty cool. Thanks. <laughs> I'd love to see what it looks like underneath the water too. Thanks. Right? And I've got one other. I am uh, curating a show actually in Hudson, New York that's mm -hmm. going to be opening in May. Oh, really? um, yeah, it's titled What Could Possibly Go Wrong? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I look that should to be it. good. That That's should be good. good. So we threw this together very quickly, and I can't thank you both enough for making the time to get here and, yeah, and this, this was talk unique about opportunity it. And, and, I, it was, and I hope that this anniversary celebration is as great as it should be. Me too. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Huh. Well, I don't know where you guys live listening in right now, but uh, where we are, it is really, really cold. And what better time to gather up the family, make a fire, and catch up on past episodes of the b &H Photography Podcast. If you are not a subscriber, it's easy. It's free. It's informative and entertaining. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, Spotify, and you can always find us on the B&H Explorer website. And heads up because we have a new Facebook page coming up soon, too. For now, on behalf of Jason, John, and myself, thank you so much for tuning in today.